So welcome to today's edition of The World Today. Uh, what, this edition is co-sponsored by the Penn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media, and also the Department of Biology. And as I mentioned before, this is part of the week's university-wide, uh, sorry, the, this week's university-wide Climate Week initiative, who our moderator, Simon Richter, uh, has had a very large hand in developing and nurturing over these last many years. So in this discussion, experts will talk about the interconnected and compounded impact of pollution, climate change, and biodiversity loss. Globally, ecosystems are being destroyed by climate-driven crises such as wildfires, flooding, extreme tropical storms, and extreme heat. And the biodiversity loss crisis threatens humanity's ability to survive and adapt to climate change. As 1 million species are at risk of extinction by 2050, the call to act is increasingly urgent. And we today and in the future will be looking to experts to try to find a path forward. So I look forward and I hope you do as well to hearing from this panel on, uh, about these critical issues. And let me tell you who they will be. So joining us first will be Earl Akshay, who's an associate professor of biology here at Penn. He's a theoretical biologist who works on the evolution of complex biological and social organization. And he also is one of the core faculty at Penn teaching ecology. The second speaker is Michael Mann, who is a faculty fellow at Perry Roadhouse and the presidential distinguished professor in the Department of Earth and Environmental Science with a secondary appointment in the Annenberg School for Communication. And Mike, met, known to many of you, his research focuses on climate change and climate communication. Our third speaker is Inta Summers, a former uh, Perry Wildhouse Fellow and a Humanitarian Affairs Officer with the United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, UN OCHA. She's a specialist in risk management and climate change adaptation. She's working to reduce vulnerability to climate shocks by strengthening early warning systems and anticipatory action systems. She also is a biologist by training. And I'm pleased to say, and the first time to get to announce here, that uh, Zinta has recently been elected the Vice Chair of Working Group 2 for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So hopefully over the next many years, we'll have uh, a chance to interact with the IPCC via uh, Zinta. Finally, this panel will be moderated by Simon Richter. Simon is the class of 1942 endowed term professor of German and Dutch literature. He studies literature, film, and culture, and he's a faculty fellow at Perry Roadhouse. Professor Richter's research deals with the cultural aspects of adaptation, resilience, and migration in the context of the climate emergency. He focuses in particular on the role of narrative in imagining and designing optimal responses to future climate scenarios in Germany, Indonesia, the Netherlands, and the United States. And as I said before, Climate Week at Penn would not have been possible without Simon's leadership. So please join me in welcoming the distinguished guests to the stage. Okay, it is such a huge treat to see so many of you here. I'm gonna make an assumption. Um, the assumption is that you all are not biodiversity experts. You are not biodiversity experts, uh, but you have a uh, an urgent interest in knowing what the connection between climate change and the biodiversity crisis is. I think we've made a lot of headway on um, climate literacy. Uh, but I think we have a deficit in the area of what I'm going to call biodiversity literacy. That may not be true for all of you. It certainly is true for me. Um, and that's why I'm very happy that I have these panelists here with me to help us understand what the connection is. Um, so um, questions arise. Have you heard we're in the midst of the sixth extinction? This, that this could be a mass extinction event that we are witnessing, uh, that we are perhaps participating in as well. Um, someone, Chris Packham, has even called it a an ex mass extermination event. These things are really unsettling, but at the same time, I have a feeling that many of us don't really know uh, how to contextualize that. What exactly does that mean? That's what these three individuals are here for. They're here to help us to understand that. And without my saying anything much more, I'm just going to say that um, the conversation is going to proceed as follows. I'm going to start by asking Errol 
our biologists some questions. Uh, then I'm going to move to Zinta uh, and ask her about uh, the connection between the biodiversity crisis and sort of human communities. And finish then with Michael, uh, Mike, uh, and ask him about the connection between the climate crisis, climate change, and the biodiversity crisis. So Errol, uh, why don't we kick it off? Um, what is biodiversity and why should humans care about biodiversity? Um, yeah, very good question. So biodiversity is uh, is essentially the collection of all the biological uh, organisms and and the diversity within them. And it's it was it's a concept that can go that can you can think of it as in terms of the ecosystems. You can think of this in terms of species, which is what's most common to them like different, the number of species in a given place. But you can also think of it in terms of within the species, the amount of genetic diversity within a species or the amount of phenotypic diversity or the trait diversity and so on. So biodiversity really is a catch-all term that captures all of these different aspects of uh, biological variation um, that affects how life operates, essentially. Right, but why should we care about that? So what, why, what, what the condition of biodiversity is? Right, why why do we care about it? Because it turns out uh, we actually rely a lot about, on biodiversity for for a lot of things. So for anything from uh, clean water uh, to uh, growing our food, uh, we rely on soil biodiversity for that, uh, to uh, lots of uh, uh, lots of you know drugs or compounds or building materials. These are all coming from nature, and and a lot of times we are think we we are we sort of in living in a consumer society or like in a Western society. You you think of it in terms of you know things you go and get from the market, and they're kind of widgets and interchangeable and so on. But turns out, in nature, things are not necessarily interchangeable. And the kind of wood, for example, you use for building is important, and the uh, and the kind of uh, microbes that you have in the soil are important for how your crops are going to do and so on. And then, of course, there are things like drugs, for example. Um, for example, in just 2019, there was they just discovered the, the first antibiotic that was effective against gram-negative bacteria like E. coli. Uh, that was like the first new class of antibiotics since 1960s, okay? Which is a big thing because antibiotic resistance has been is a big issue. And 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 this was discovered in the gut microbiome of a nematode that uh, is a parasite of, of herbivorous insects, okay? So, so if, Biodiversity is important like this because important for that because you know without the insects you don't have the nematode and without the nematode you don't have this bacteria that produces it, this antibiotic and then you're stuck with basically like pre penicillin days where you get a cut and you die afterwards because all the bacteria are resistant. Okay, um, one of the things that I've run into and and repeatedly I would say is that um, about a million species are threatened by extinction. Um, so what is the scientific consensus at this point with regard to the condition of biodiversity? So the scientific consensus is pretty clear that we are putting extraordinary pressure on, on species globally, uh, species health globally. And um, one of the sort of cleanest and starkest examples of this is basically the species that have gone extinct, that we know have gone extinct. They used to, they used to exist and they don't anymore. And, and if you just look at those cases, these are, again, these are experts have evaluated, handpicked, like hand created list of which what, what has gone extinct. Uh, we are either 10, somewhere between 10 to almost uh, a thousand times higher than back what, what people call background extinction rate, which is these the extinction rates that we can infer from the fossil record, recent fossil record that uh, has gone uh, over like millions of years up, up until now. But in the last hundred years, we are definitely exceeding that by orders of magnitude. So, so this is definitely a very high extinction rate. And if we kept, if this kept going for any amount of time, we would definitely qualify, you know, some, some paleontologists, you know, if they exist, you know, 10 million years from now would quantify this as a mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, a last question for you before I turn to Zinta. Um, I'd like to ask, from the, a biologist's perspective, what would it take for the human community, say, through the United Nations, perhaps, through UNEP, what would it take for us to get a handle on the biodiversity crisis? Right, so 
we there are sort of generally sort of five categories of core uh, uh, causes of you know this extinction crisis or or species being threatened, um, and the most important ones actually are, uh, I mean the most important two uh, so far has been land use change. So we're taking natural systems and turning them to either you know built environment or we're turning them into croplands or pasture land. So that land use change is a big contributor because it just destroys the habitat and everything in it, basically. And then direct exploitation, basically hunting or or fishing. Okay. Uh, so um, so those are the two big cause of extinction so far, and we need to handle. Uh, uh, um, basically, we need to get a handle on them, especially land use change, um, and set aside land, natural land, to uh, uh, to to conserve species and also restore some of the degraded ecosystems. But also, but now going forward, climate change is making having an even bigger impact because a lot of this land use change has left species in a in a smaller area and has left them with uh, the, with less genetic variation. So they they're less able to adapt to climate change. So climate change is going to be a big big factor going forward. And then of course, then there are things like pollution um, that we also directly need to address. But you know, those are. Um, and also climate change actually also kind of interacts with pollution because it, it might increase actually runoffs like nitrogen runoffs into marine ecosystems and so on. So those are all connected to each other. But land use change uh, and keeping a keeping a you know lid on land use change and exploitation and um, and keeping lid on climate change is going to be the big ones. Okay, thank you very much, Errol. Um, Zinta, I'm going to turn to you now. I'm going to try to with your help, make the connection between the biodiversity crisis and human communities. So from your perspective, um, humans exist within nature, not next to it, right? Um, why should human communities uh, value biodiversity? Great, uh, well, thank you for that question. I think that was already alluded to, the answers alluded to in the, in the previous uh, comments. Um, Humans, obviously, biodiversity loss will affect our ecosystem services and the ability of ecosystems to provide services, be they cultural services or provisioning services, the supply of food or regulatory services, for example, the way that soil or flood water, um, uh, fl uh, water is, is uh, managed in, in ecosystems. To give you an example of some of these potential losses, my um, family, they're both immigrants. My parents are immigrants from Latvia. And in Latvia, there's a wealth of, of uh, national folklore and poetry about our relationship with species, you know, and stories about you should knit socks for wolves because their feet are cold in the winter. Likewise here, some of the national symbols are, are animals such as the bald eagle. And when these species disappear, there is a cultural loss that is, it's perhaps in the climate space, we call that a non-economic loss, but it is still of, of great significance. For my other, on my other hat, I work in disaster risk reduction. And this summer, all of us have seen the devastating fires that have occurred in North America. You may have experienced the air pollution, smelt the smoke, seen the uh, incredible sunsets that result from, from some of this. Uh, that was made possible in part by a loss of biodiversity. Yes, there's a climate link and, and Michael will go into that further. But the fact is in many of the Northern forests, after uh, they were clear cut, there was tree planting. And often that tree planting was through black spruce. It wasn't a biodiverse forest that it missed aspen and poplars. And that black spruce, unfortunately, is is like a, a match or a tinderbox. It's very easy to, to light and, and leads to devastating fires. So this is an example of of uh, again, a change, a loss of biodiversity that very directly impacts infrastructure, lives and livelihoods. And of course, obviously I've mentioned um, food provision. And, and as you mentioned, um, the fact that we, we lose, I don't know, species of banana or coffee, or it produces our ability to be resilient in future because we'll have less diversity to choose from in changing our crops and making identify more adaptable crops to different uh, climate systems. Yeah, I was waiting for that word resilient and there it was. So, uh, you know, robust biodiversity means resilience and resilience is really important for sure. Um, so your bio says that you've held a number of climate related roles in the UN. Um, what should we know about the Kunming Montreal 
uh, global biodiversity framework, COP15, right? This is not the climate COP, but the biodiversity COP. W what's important for us to know about that? <clears throat> Yeah, I, mean, I think there's, so in 2022, uh, about a year ago, there was a new uh, uh, agreement reached amongst governments of the world. And this is, is very significant. Uh, both the biodiversity, the Convention on Biodiversity, and the UN Framework Convention for Climate Change were uh, created in 1992. So they, they are almost like a brother and sister or a familial relationship. They both... Uh, I would say in large parts haven't been successful in, in many ways. So the Convention Biodiversity, for example, they had targets set uh, in 2010 um, about outlining what governments of the world should do to protect biodiversity. And in 2020, the CBD reported that none of these targets had been met, uh, that we're really lacking the implementation of targets. And this is, of course, something that we're struggling with in the climate community right now. We're making lots of pledges. Where is the action? So last year, governments got together to say, we need to really commit to action. And they uh, announced or agreed upon four goals and 23 targets. Uh, and we can go into that a little bit later. But I think what's interesting is that across both the CBD and the UNFCCC, there are similar, um, but there's similar history, but also now going forward, similar framing. So both these conventions now have goals and the idea is to ratchet up the ambition over time. In both, there was a lot of discussion about finance. How do we finance action? So in the climate world, you might know that there's discussion right now about a new loss and damage fund, about how we get 100 billion. In the biodiversity world, I think they want 200 billion per year by, is it 2030? But they also want 30 billion from developed countries. So this issue of how do we finance implementation is, is we should all focus on that. And I think the other thing is obviously uh, two final points. One is the Convention on Biodiversity has very clear targets that now um, that are almost like a roadmap for governments about what they should do. For example, reducing subsidies in certain areas, helping industry focus on biodiversity. The COP, on climate can learn from that because there we have targets, also the 1.5 degree goal, for example, but no clear roadmap for how this should be implemented. And each government's supposed to come up with a strategy. And some have said that actually UNFCCC should learn from this new can CBD, uh, the agreement um, that was, was reached there about how we can implement and, and really get to action on the ground. And the final thing that I'll say is that to some degree, uh, the two are tied in that unless we achieve our climate goals, a lot of the biodiversity uh, will be lost. And I'll leave that maybe to Michael to answer. Okay, um, there is sort of an elephant that's not in the room. Um, there are 196 parties to this, uh, to the global biodiversity framework and the United States is not among them. Does that make a difference? Does that matter? I'm actually still asking you, Zinta, is that okay? And then I'll go to Mike, yeah. I mean, I think um, now the, the United States is not part of it. Yeah. Uh, and it is, however, participating in the discussions. I would say that um, that in all these treaties, be it the climate treaty or, uh, or the, the biodiversity, there are, you can still achieve a lot by um, by having a soft agreement if the implementation is there. So for example, if the United States is not part of the treaty, and I'm not actually an expert in that, others might want to comment on that. But if at the national level, you implement legislation and execute these actions, then the effect will be the same. And I think that's the real issue that even in the climate space, we often have governments that are party to it and making pledges, but we're not taking the actions on the ground, we're not implementing. And the real question is, in all of these, are we implementing? Right. Okay, thank you very much, Sinta. Mike, um, I guess I'd like to start off with a question, um, just basically, could you connect the dots for us? Uh, some of them have already been connected, but let's have your take. How do you connect the biodiversity crisis and climate change? Yeah, well, um, you know, there's no question, as we've already heard, uh, that climate change is one of the contributors to what 
we you know, are now characterizing as the next great extinction event, something that would be looked back upon as a, as a major uh, geological extinction event. Um, you know, my perspective has been uh, colored and informed by uh, the research that I've done for my latest book, blatant uh, plug here, uh, Our Fragile Moment, which is about the lessons that we can learn from uh, the climate crisis by looking at the past. And so one of the things that I do is I look at some of the past uh, extinction events um, and uh, perhaps the most prominent is what's known as the Great Dying. It was the end Permian extinction 250 million years ago when 90% of all genera, basically 90% of species uh, uh, succumbed to that event. 96% uh, of all marine biota uh, went extinct during that event. And some people look at that and they see that as an analog for uh, human-caused extinction today, the extinction that will result from climate change. Uh, the end Permian extinction was driven in part by climate change. There was a, a large input of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere uh, from a major volcanic uh, outgassing event, um, just like we're adding CO2 to the atmosphere today through fossil fuel burning. This was a natural input of carbon dioxide. But there were other things uh, that went on. Uh, there was a massive deoxygenation of the oceans um, uh, that probably led to a, an increase in hydrogen sulfide. Uh, essentially, my colleague Lee Kump, who studied this in some detail, my former Penn State colleague Lee Kump, um, has described it as a global stink bomb. If you've ever experienced a stink bomb, imagine that at the planetary scale. And, and that's what happened, uh, apparently. So there are things about that event that are analogous to today, but there are other things that happened that aren't. And so it's difficult to tease out what's, you know, what is the precise lesson when it comes to extinction today? Um, I would argue that we are not yet committed to an end Permian-like extinction. But if we continue on the course that we're on, uh, something like that ultimately could happen. The other point I would make um, is that while this was a rapid event, and there are other rapid events, the so-called PETM, uh, the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum, it was a fairly rapid warming event about 56 million years ago um, that also led to uh, extinctions. and. It was, um, you know, we call it rapid on a geological scale, but what's happening today is at least a hundred times more rapid than any of these natural events, and that's caught, uh, you know, that that's that's cause for, um, you know, for uh, precaution here because what we're causing today. Yes, there were times when carbon dioxide concentrations were higher than they are today, when the planet was warmer than today but we haven't seen these rates of warming. And ultimately the challenge is for adaptation and uh, behavioral plasticity to allow organisms to adapt to changes. If you have a long time to adapt, it's much easier than if you have a, a relatively short time. Moreover, we're creating all sorts of infrastructure. We have cities and highways that uh, prevent um, the migration of species in the way that they would have been able to migrate in the past. And so the lesson is that, you know, it's all about the rate of warming, the rate of carbon input. And if we continue on this trajectory, then I think there's no question that climate change will be a major contributor to what will be described as the six um, great, you know, e extinction event. Thank you. Um, recently, a report came out of Stockholm um, about planetary boundaries. Um, this is a model for understanding what's going on that tries to look at a bigger picture. I think there are nine different boundaries. And this report said that uh, as of 2023, we've transgressed six of those boundaries. So I wonder if you could help us put that in perspective and also relate it to both biodiversity and climate change. Sure, yeah, that's, we've transgressed six of those nine uh, boundaries, which means three of them we haven't, so we're doing okay. Uh, 
<laughs> no, <laughs> it, it's bad news for certain. Many of you probably read the headlines uh, uh, of that study that appeared, I think, about a week ago. Um, and there is, I think there has been some miscommunication uh, and misperception of what that study actually shows. First of all, these planetary boundaries are, you know, we come up against boundaries. Climate change is a boundary. If we warm the planet too much, then we threaten the habitability uh, of uh, the, the continuation of human civilization and the habitability of the planet. If we acidify the oceans, um, then we are again challenging uh, life on this planet. Uh, when we pollute the air and water, um, so there are at least nine different dimensions, ways um, that we are impacting the, the planet in a way that is ultimately unsustainable if we continue uh, on that course. And the alarming headline was that we've surpassed six of those nine planetary boundaries. It makes it sound like these are points of no return. Um, if you actually look at how these boundaries are described, there's a very important distinction. Um, these are not... Uh, d distinction. There's a, th these are not boundaries um, where, uh, you know, uh, that define extinction of life. These are boundaries that define the end of what you might call, um, uh, I think they use the, the term uh, uh, flourishing, uh, you know, so what it means is we are past the point where the conditions, uh, if they are maintained, will allow life to flourish. It doesn't mean the end of life. It doesn't mean extinction, but it means a degraded planet where life, uh, you know, we and other living things um, are, 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 uh, are ultimately uh, challenged. So it's really a warning if we continue on this path of environmental degradation, of overfishing, of ocean acidification, of uh, warming uh, due to carbon pollution. If we continue on this path, um, then ultimately, you know, we face the potential cl collapse of, of, you know, human civilization, uh, the collapse of ecosystems in the biosphere. So this is really a wake-up call that we're, we're on that path. And for six of these nine measures, we're in the danger zone. We're not past the danger limit. I think that's what I'm trying to communicate here. We are in the danger zone for six of those nine, one of which is climate change. And so uh, to be precise, we can sort of drill down just a little bit on climate. One and a half degrees Celsius. That's why we have the 1.5 minute talks tomorrow as part of climate week, because 1.5 is an important number. Um, in Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit, is the point beyond which we start to see some of the most damaging uh, impacts of climate change. We are not yet committed to one and a half degrees Celsius warming of the planet. If we rapidly decarbonize the global economy, if we lower carbon emissions by 50% by 2030, that's an uphill challenge, but it's doable. The obstacles aren't physical. They're not uh, they're not technological, they're entirely political at this point. Um, uh, we can still avoid warming the planet more than one and a half Celsius, three degrees Fahrenheit. So in their study, we've already surpassed the climate boundary. But in reality, we haven't really surpassed the climate danger zone yet, uh, bringing again that distinction uh, into focus here. Okay, great. Mike, uh, one of the wonderful things that you bring us at Penn is a uh, steady message about a urgency and agency. And I'm, I'm going to throw a, this question out there for anyone. Mike, you can, of course, take a, um, well, take a stab at it. You can, you can go for it, but others can as well. Every once in a while, you get the sense that proponents of the energy transition, a rapid energy transition, um, are um, being opposed by proponents of uh, nature conservation, for instance. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's a very cynical, as for, we've seen lately, uh, you know, from um, uh, people claiming that whales uh, are being harmed by wind turbines or windmills, as you said. Windmills wind mills. that are killing the whales, according yeah. to Senator Ron exactly. Johnson. Right. Yes. But I want to understand, is, is, is there some kind of a tension between these two? 
And more importantly, is there a useful way to align both uh, action regarding bio conservation of biodiversity and, and climate change? What are some examples of how we can combine those in our actions? Yeah, I'm happy to take a first stab and then uh, others uh, can weigh in as well. Um, so, you know, there are often what we call uh, co-benefits. Uh, many of the actions that we take to address the climate crisis, um, less, you know, use of resources, uh, recycling, um, all these things that we can do in our everyday lives that decrease our carbon footprint, they're better for the environment, they're better for you know, sustainability writ large and for biodiversity. And so we should do all those things. And I think what, Simon, what you're alluding to is the fact that there are some bad actors out there who have tried to pit environmentalists against each other by convincing some in the environmental community that, hey, if you care about the whales, then you really shouldn't support uh, wind energy um, because as Ron Johnson, a senator from uh, Wisconsin, uh, insists, the windmills are killing the whales, which I guess that means that the whales the, of the North Sea must be jumping up towards those, uh, those Dutch windmills and getting scratched and then they get infected um, and trying to get at the grain in those windmills. And uh, it just makes no sense at all, of course. Um, what he was trying to communicate was this idea that um, wind turbines um, uh, it, uh, out at sea uh, are you know, creating problems for whales. There's no science to support that. It, it's a myth, but it's gotten, it's gained quite a bit of currency, not necessarily among conservatives who have often opposed climate action, but it's gained quite a bit of currency among progressives who are convinced that, oh, maybe renewable energy you know, is, is bad for biodiversity, bad for whales. Um, that's a real win for the bad actors, because what they've done there is weaponize part of the community of people who would otherwise be most in support of the actions that are necessary, both to reduce our carbon emissions and preserve, you know, our, our environment and bio, uh, you know, and um, biodiversity. And so we have to be aware of the ways in which bad actors are trying to uh, weaponize uh, some of these claims. Um, and sometimes there's a grain of truth. In this case, there isn't even a grain of truth. The science just doesn't support it. You know, the claim was that the, um, the, the, the noise that they make uh, is interfering with whale communication. Um, there's a commission, a governmental commission that looked into it and said, there's just no evidence of that at all. And yet this talking point um, has gained quite a bit of currency uh, today. Errol, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, um, I think that's, um, there is, but, and then coming back to the sort of the question, the part of the question where if there is any uh, things that are aligned between climate change and biodiversity conservation, I mean, there's one big thing for, uh, there are lots of things. And one big thing is, uh, again, this land use change and, um, and specifically actually sort of, you know, meat consumption, beef. Uh, so a lot of, so reducing meat consumption uh, or somehow intensifying meat consumption so we don't need more land actually turns out to have huge both, both huge emissions benefits but also it reduces the pressure on natural ecosystems to, to, to convert natural ecosystems like the Amazon um, into uh, pasture land so so there's actually lots of and intensifying agriculture in general uh, and using better and these are a lot of times these are actually even there like Mike was saying a lot of them they, these aren't actually like even, economic ops there are economic obstacles because these are economically actually beneficial for everybody uh there is some cultural obstacles for take up of these things and there are some so for example you know artificial meat uh and then there is a bit of like regulatory capture and uh political obstacle uh in a lot of these things and but but these are i think the urgency is very useful here because once we recognize the urgency of the problem these are these political, uh, you know, obstacles can be overcome. And if I can just jump in from the, the the policy side, I think there also needs to be an alignment between some of the goals, and we're beginning to see that. So, part of the new um, agreement was that, or one of the aspirations, is to have thirty percent of terrestrial freshwater or ocean um, protected by twenty thirty. And of course, that is also something the 30 to 50 percent goal of conservation is is mentioned frequently by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change is a very important 
climate change adaptation mechanism and both to preserve, help preserve the biodiversity, um, also because of obviously the, the ability of, of green spaces to, con to capture uh, uh, carbon and, and to help with mitigation as well. So, so I think there's a lot of synergies and the more that we can have these policy goals align and to have the convention, convention for biodiversity speak to UNFCCC, uh, that I think the easier and more successful action will be. And we, we can't have this kind of separation between the, the scientists or the policymakers. All right. So thanks very much from me. Um, we are now at the point where we'd like to uh, uh, transition to Q and A. Um, so mics are magically going to appear. They have, or there is one over there. So if you have a question, please line up by the mic. When you step up to the mic, do say your name, please, and uh, keep your question really brief. And if it's directed to somebody, then please add that as well. And uh, so we have a we have question or a questions or a question from on the online audience. Go ahead. Yes. So the first question is, could you give us your opinion on the European Union biodiversity strategy and other more regional but still multilateral biodiversity issues that we face? <laughs> I'm not the biodiversity person here. I'm the climate person. Uh, um, so I don't have a lot to say on that one. Yeah. Errol, do you have anything? I don't have anything to sp specific to say about that, except one general point is that um, in the absence of what Zinta was alluding to, actually, so a lot of times global agreements are hard to agree on and then implement. And a lot of times non-global agreements, like local agreements with between countries that are somehow more aligned can be actually very effective to uh, it start addressing problems and then sort of coalesce, you know, at the global level. So I was oh. just going to observe that. Yeah, also because of contiguity, right? They share borders and nature doesn't know borders, right? Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Gerhard. Um, the cost of uh, gene sequencing and proteomics and even uh, freezing stem cells, embryos, uh, haploid cells has really come down a lot. Um, do you think that there could be benefits to trying to back up as much of the a biome as possible uh, before it goes away. I, I guess I'll take that. Um, there could be benefits, um, but I think it's going to be there. It's going to be limited because we don't understand what we're trying to conserve fully, right? Because we don't actually understand a lot of the, how they how like natural ecosystems work in a lot of cases, and and there are we we constantly discover like. Asian, so, so there's a there's a concept of keystone species in ecology, and the keystone state species is a species that doesn't actually jump out at you when you look at the ecosystem, but it has a disproportionate impact on the structure of the ecosystem. The the, the canonical example is uh, is the sea stars and the rocky intertidal zone in Washington coast, and they they don't make up a lot of the biomass, but turns out because they eat the fast growing mussel species on those rocks on those intertidal zones, rocks they increase the biodiversity of that system by a lot because other species, barnacles can come in and uh, have a space to land actually. And, but so if you took, take away the sea stars, like which again, you wouldn't guess without studying it for like 30 years is the, is the key, keystone species, the whole system collapses. And, and there's things like there's, there, sometimes this is a microbial species. Sometimes this is an insect that you didn't know about. So, so it's a risky strategy. Um, there are, uh, ways so, so there are efforts to like you know seed banks for example that, that to preserve seeds uh, especially preserve seeds that are uh, uh, sort of native seeds or or seeds that are uh, wild seeds uh, so there's um, or have wild ancestors to preserve some of the more biodiversity so those can be useful but it's not really a real solution to the to the preserving the real thing because we don't necessarily understand what the real thing how the real thing works. Let me just add one quick uh, sort of ironic note here. Um, as some of you may have read this story a few years ago. The, the seed repository I think you're, you're describing is in Svalbard. Um, and uh, Svalbard is warming dramatically. Uh, and the, the building in which it was housed was damaged because of the melting ice. And uh, ironically, <laughs> climate change here now, uh, impact. but there's a larger point that I'd like to make here, um, which is that one of the things that I think we have to be aware of 
um, and, and, and some of these proposals smack a little bit of that, is the idea that technology will save us. Um, because this is used a lot today in the climate change uh, arena uh, to motivate what we call greenwash, this idea that, look, we will develop technology to scrub the carbon from the atmosphere. We can cool the planet back down by injecting particles into the stratosphere. Trust us, we can, save, we, we can solve this problem later sometimes used as an excuse for continued business as usual today. And so I think we have to be wary of the argument that technology will somehow come and rescue us in the end. It's a very dangerous position to be in. Uh, it, and it is mocked. If you've seen the movie, Don't Look Up, mm -hmm. that very notion is very clearly satirized. I won't give it uh, away. I won't give the film away, but you should watch it because I think that message comes across very strongly. So no lifeboats, basically, on your ship. I mean, if I can just quickly add to that about the, I think the the hubris that we have to try to avoid, and and when we talk about ecosystems and both about climate and the climate system and our lack of knowledge of how some things work, but also in in terms of biodiversity. In my own PhD research, I was looking uh, studying chimpanzee populations and. Um, the impact of environmental change on chimps. In one population, there were 10 chimps in a little tiny forest fragment surrounded by sugarcane fields. And all the conservationists were like, this population is doomed, get them out of here. We need to try to relocate them. And we were studying their stress level and their disease level to try to prove that this population was doing horribly. And what we actually found was because this little population was surrounded by sugarcane, they were doing great. They would just walk out and they had food everywhere. And but, so their stress levels are really low, their cortisol levels, but they had evidence of cavities because of all the sugar. And so we were shocked that, okay, actually, I mean, obviously long-term, you're not a population of 10 is not going to do very well, but maybe in the short term on an individual level, aside from potential cavities, they were, they were doing much better than their relatives in the pristine forest that had to walk for hours every day to find a fig. Um, and I think, yeah, that's in general that it's a role for Penn and for scientists and those of you here to continue to learn about how we best can can help these ecosystems uh, and, and the animals they're in. Well, we have a dental school here as well, so maybe some <laughs> of the folks. Uh, from... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Dean Wolf participated in a panel this afternoon. We have another question. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks uh, for putting together these dots in this great talk. Um, I wanted to come back to a comment that Zinta made that was related to the loss of biodiversity in some cases as more of a cultural loss rather than an economic loss. Um, but I'd like to sort of come back to my wheelhouse, which is research in the Galapagos Islands. Um, the Galapagos has a paradox that is commonly associated with it. That is that biodiversity is really connected in a very deep way to the economy. About 80% of the Galapagos economy is related to tourism. Um, so if a certain species were to be lost, it might very well be a, a more direct economic impact. Um, and to add to this, there's droves of people going to Galapagos. And last year alone, it was about 260,000 people. Um, and they're on track to increase that now. So one of the ways that Ecuador kind of approaches some of these threats um, is that they have this special law that gives nature rights in the constitution. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this type of law, how it kind of plays out and what its utility may be in the future in trying to help unite these concepts of both biodiversity and climate change and finding solutions. You can go for a second. I mean, I've, I've got some thoughts just as somebody who cares uh, about these things. Um, you know, I, I do think that too often, you know, it, it, these, you know, biodiversity is framed in term purely in terms of uh, ecosystem services, what they can do for us. And that's a very anthropocentric way of looking at sort of the issue of the viability of our planetary system. And so I do think um, the notion that there is intrinsic worth um, to ecosystems and to animal species is critical um, if we are to not fall into the trap of uh, allowing that to become an externality. It's not priced in the marketplace in a formal way, and so it, it's subject to tragedy of the commons. Um, that's the danger when we try to monetize things purely in terms of what they can provide human beings without recognizing, you know, the, the need, you know, there, there is no economy on a dead planet. 
I mean, I think <clears throat> obviously it's hard to follow uh, such eloquent words, but I mean, I think certainly the issue of how we can use um, rights and rights based, rights based approaches and also the judicial system to try to achieve action is a really, really interesting field right now, both in the climate space and also, you know, in, in terms of biodiversity and conservation and even here in the U.S. And, you know, I came down from New York today and there were cases about an elephant in the, you know, the Bronx Zoo and its right and 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 so they can be really powerful tools um, that we should explore. That that's one. And I'm obviously not a lawyer, so I won't I won't say more than that. But just that I think that there might be some promise there and something we should follow. Um, in terms of the other the point about this non-economic losses, we call them the climate space nels, non-economic losses and damages. Um, and I agree that I think probably if we can make all the cases we want about ecosystem services and the provision for us, but the 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 real point is that every species has an intrinsic value, but the challenge is for policymakers, what do we do with that? And, and I think in the climate space, we're seeing that the real reckoning of how do we deal with the non-economic losses? How do we best address that? How do we, to some degree, often you have to assign a value just because that's how policymakers work and they need to know how much money we need to deal with something to, And so that's, it's an also a, it's a big challenge for the policymaker, that space. Um, yeah, I'm going to end there. Okay, super. Um, yeah, next question. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm Alan from Indonesia. I have a question, two questions actually. The first one is uh, to Sinta. There is one to your um, explanation regarding that the US is not a member of COP15. Do you think that 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 do you think that the fact that you the US is not a member will halt the global climate driven solutions considering that the UN the funds, funding for, for the UN is generally coming from the United States. Do you think in the global uh, scale, it will halt you know, our initiatives there are, or there are on more of the grassroots level? Secondly, and re related to the, um, on the grassroots level initiative, do you think the transnational organizations will contribute significantly more than the governments and the countries that are usual that they are supposed to be having these responsibilities. For the, take an, an example of Greenpeace or maybe Climate Action Network. Their movements are more um, strategic and more grassroots, and that's where usually the problems are usually are on the grassroots level. That's all. Thank you. All right, maybe I'll say th three points and others can always jump in. Um, so first about the role of the grassroots, I think it's critical. Uh, we see, you know, on Sunday, there was a climate action um, march in New York. And um, certainly for policymaking, uh, the role of, of uh, civil society is critical and indigenous and local communities. And I think just as a reflection of that, also to do, and again, I'm more of an expert on UNFCCC than the, the Convention on Biodiversity, but in the new agreement, the actual role of indigenous communities is is recognized and there are in some of the targets they specifically acknowledge that indigenous communities must play a role as um as as the kind of the the stakeholders and uh, the carers of biodiversity and we know that i think some estimates are 80% of biodiversity is in the hands of indigenous communities so we can't we have to include them in in our solutions and they must help us solve you know and 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 be guardians of this so that, that's one. Um, in terms of the role of finance, and I don't want to specifically talk about the role of the U.S. again, partly because I don't represent the U.S. and and also partly as the U.N. staff member, I need to be you know uh, apolitical. But I do think that the solutions, um, obviously there's a lot of pressure on donor countries uh, to both finance. I mentioned some of the numbers. We're talking about 200 billion for bio biodiversity and 100 billion per year for for climate related finance and then now with this new loss and damage fund they're talking about another 100 billion I mean we, we can all look around the table and say where is that money going to come from and I personally don't believe that it can come from a single government or a single source and we need to include the private sector we need to include you know and and the role that you know the private sector or some of for example, the windfall <laughs> profits from oil revenues should be part of the solution. We can look at um, levies and taxes on airlines and things like that. So innovative finance will be critical to unlocking this. Um, but yes, obviously, uh, the donor countries 
need to play an active role in in financing this as well. Or um, and that is part of partly why you have you know thirty billion has to come from in the in the new um, uh, climate uh, the biodiversity agreement has to come from developed countries. And of course, there's the common but differentiated responsibility in the climate space, which points to the fact that that some countries um, have to play a more active role and should play an active role. Over. Okay, I think we have another online question. Yes, so this question says that uh, since climate change and biodiversity are linked, to what extent do the UNFCCC and CBD collaborate and cooperate? Why are these global goals negotiated in silos? I'll take that quickly, but I don't want to dominate the speaking. We, we do policy at Perry World House, and uh, that's, that's what happens. I mean, I think there have been articles about this. Um, and we in the climate world often think that we're the center of the world and everything. So traditionally, um, while in the Convention of Biodiversity, there has been more focus on the role of climate in, in being one of the drivers of biodiversity loss, I think it hasn't gone both ways, but that's changing. And a quick answer is that there was, for the first time, a biodiversity day at COP, I believe, last year. Um, and in UAE this year, there is increasing also continued conversation about the kind of the the biodiversity and climate change together. So this is something that is hopefully changing and growing and others might want to add. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, Chris, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. Uh, thanks so much. This has been a really interesting uh, and interesting uh, discussion. Uh, I have a question about not necessarily responsibility, but accountability, um, especially given that we're not necessarily just in damage prevention mode, but also in damage mitigation mode at this point. Uh, so curious to hear from your perspectives uh, in your various you know, uh, meetings and, and convenings with other folks who are focused on this issue, uh, whether or not the, the question of accountability has come up for when there is damage and somebody is gonna need to hopefully you know, find a way to support resource-wise uh, damage mitigation. Thank you. I would just mention on the climate front, uh, some of you may be familiar with the fact, the headline over the last uh, day or two, that the governor of California is suing uh, the fossil fuel industry for the damage that they have done, the wildfires, the floods, real damage that's been done by the climate crisis, for which they are ultimately largely responsible. 70% of uh, total carbon emissions come from just 100 uh, polluting companies. And so that is um, on the table now. I mean, quickly, the um, Paris Agreement, I think, quite explicitly excludes the compensation. So that's that's kind of, that's off the table. Um, it is obviously, you know, I think an underlying current in the current, you know, a, a pretext or perhaps that that thread is there in the discussions about this new uh, loss and damage fund and uh, so so it's it, but it, but there will never be um, kind of a this occurs and therefore we're, we're compensating you under the Paris agreement all right would uh, reducing population growth have a significant benefit uh, both for climate change and species extinction and uh, as horrible as China's one child policy, was uh, do would they have uh, substantially uh, reduced their uh, contribution to global warming by that? I'm happy to take a stab here. Uh, take one for the team. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is you know a question that often comes up, and it's it's a it's a really nuanced issue because um, ultimately. Sure, more people on the planet using more resources puts more stress on you know ecosystems, uh, uh, produces more carbon pollution, produces more warming, more climate change. But it really matters what sort of lifestyle those people are living. And people in you know the developing world have carbon footprints that are orders of magnitude smaller than those of us in the Western world. And so, yes, it is true that there are finite resources on this planet and there's only a finite number of human beings that can live on this planet. And the carrying capacity right now, um, by some estimates, uh, ecologists uh, who, who, who study this in detail, it, it's probably, we have boosted it by more than a factor of 10 by the technology that we have. But that, you know, so we support at least 10 times as many people who could 
otherwise live on this planet uh, through the infrastructure that we've created, but that infrastructure is fragile. It's, it's a theme of my book. That infrastructure is based on a climate that was largely stable for 6,000 years, and now we are rapidly leaving that envelope of stability. And so, yes, um, it is true that population is part of the issue, but it's really it, it, it's not so much, at least right now, how many people there are as how many people are leading resource intensive, carbon intensive lifestyles. And that's really the sweet spot right now is to target that part of the problem. Thank you very much. Oh, Tom, you want to ask a question? Okay, this will be the last question. I have a question for Mike. Um, <clears throat> you talked about the esteemed senator from Wisconsin. How did I didn't use the word esteemed. <laughs> Some someone in the room may, but it's not me. Um, how do you get people like that to care about everything we're talking about? Because you have half the country who either doesn't believe it or doesn't care. Um, so you talk about you have a lot of facts that we've discussed today, very important facts, loss of life. Um, how do you get them to care about any of that? Thanks. It's it's a great question. Um, you know, there's not there may not be much we can do to get Ron Johnson uh, to care about climate change or any of these other problems that we're talking about because um it, it's it you know th there uh, there's a famous uh quote attributed to upton sinclair uh, it's very difficult to get a man a person uh to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it i think that's the problem that we have with uh senator johnson that having been said he's elected by people um, and there, I see the folks who vote for politicians like that as victims of misinformation. And um, so we may not be able to change Ron Johnson, but we can change who the people of Wisconsin vote for. <laughs> we can inform them. We can try to make sure that we have a more informed uh, citizenry that is armed with the knowledge and information that they need to make decisions that... Um, you know, our um, dis decisions that um, are uh, serve their own interests rather than the fossil fuel interests who too often fund the campaigns of politicians. Uh, and so that's the sweet spot is to inform the citizenry and uh, hopefully a more informed citizenry will recognize that we get the politicians we vote for. Um, and in this next election, that's going to be critical. What you know, what the United States does, as goes the United States, goes the rest of the world right now. If we're not doing our part when it comes to the climate problem, then nobody else um, is going to do their part. We've seen that uh, when there was leadership on the part of the United States um, under uh, the Obama administration. Uh, we saw China come to the table. They were decommissioning coal-fired power plants. We were working together to solve this problem. Then we elected a president who said that they were going to unilaterally pull out of the Paris Agreement, and that, uh, you know, that sent a message to the rest of the world that we're not serious. Why should they be? Uh, and so, we have immense power here in the United States, um, in particular, because um, as goes the U.S goes the rest of the world when it comes to solving problems like the climate crisis. And we have a direct role. People ask, what can I do as an individual? Sure, you know, decrease your carbon from, do all those things. But the most important thing you can do is participate in the political process and make sure that we elect policymakers who can institute the, the policy uh, changes and engage in the intergovernmental negotiations that we can't as individuals and that are ultimately necessary if we're gonna tackle this and other problems. All right, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks to all of you, all the panelists. Thank you to the audience who are here. Um, oh, I see you wanna applaud, right? Go ahead, applaud. <laughs>
I hope that your biodiversity uh, literacy has gone up several notches. Uh, let me remind you about Climate Week. It's going on um, tomorrow at noon um, underneath the college tent. There will be 1.5 minute climate lectures. Mike will be there. There'll be six others. We will be talking about our summer from hell. Uh, uh, you know, fire, ice, drought, uh, heat, et cetera, uh, by Penn faculty. Um, and there are many other really great events. You can find it if you google pen climate uh, climate week at pen michael thank you so much simon thank you so much errol mike and zinta for really um we're just scratching the surface and as with so many of these events it's clear that this could have gone on much longer and also i think you raise many threads that we should be thinking through and and uh looking in more depth and as the year goes on biodiversity is a topic that we wish to uh, deeply engage with the world house ju just as we do of course with climate simon thank you for your excellent moderation and for representing the audience so well let me also thank you audience for both online and in person for uh, your participation today i want to actually just let you know of an upcoming event so next week we're going to have our first colloquium of the year it's actually on a very different topic than climate change although maybe not um it's called a new age of nuclearity greater powers and great powers and greater consequences one of the things that's really interesting about this colloquium is that the many of the voices will be from the global south and I think you'll learn a lot from a different perspective so there'll be three public events we'll have two on Wednesday September 27th one at noon and one at four and another on Thursday these will be very high level people UN officials and ambassador you'll learn a lot about how the globe has uh, dealt with the threat of nuclear weapons and nuclear proliferation so this event as all of our events is available on youtube and i hope that you will all join our social media i'd say that you should sign up for our mailing list but you don't need to because if you've registered for this event magically you will be signed up for all of our events so we hope to see you back in this room and online uh many times in the future if you're here we have a snack for you in the back room if you're online find your microwave make your own snack thanks again to the panel Thank you all.